Hi, it's me, Tim Dodd, the Everyday Astronaut. Welcome to Starbase, Texas. Today, we're getting up close and personal with SpaceX's Raptor 2 engine with Elon Musk. We get into all sorts of details on this engine, including how exactly it's been upgraded and simplified compared to Raptor 1. This video has a ton of fun details on some fairly technical stuff. So be sure and watch my Why Don't Rocket Engines Melt video so you know what we're talking about with some of the cooling techniques, as well as my video on engine cycles so you understand how the Raptor's full flow stage combustion cycle works and why it's advantageous. My next video will be a deep dive comparing Raptor 1 and Raptor 2. We'll go over every little detail of the engine and it'll definitely help make this conversation easier to follow. It's currently in the works, so be sure and stay tuned. If you happen to find this video valuable, consider dropping a super thanks as a tip below here on YouTube, or become a channel member or Patreon supporter for early access and to show your support. Okay, let's dive into SpaceX's Raptor engine. So these were all Raptor 2s. These are all Raptor 2s? Yeah. You have this many here already? Sorry? You have this many here already? Yeah. In my head, I just wasn't even thinking. I mean, yeah, they're a lot uh, simpler. Oh, you can see that kind of octavalve thing on it. Yes. Um, so there's one, the, the, the Raptor 1 is the one that looks like the, the crazy Christmas tree there. <laughs> Um, Hence the uh, the Merry Christmas. Yeah. So and a snowman. <laughs> so it's not it's not super easy to see, but you can compare like uh, how much less there is. Like, like if you just look at like just eyeball the fiddly bits level there versus the fiddly bits level there, <laughs> like that thing's just wrapped in yeah. tons of stuff. Yeah. This is a completed engine. Wow. So a massive amount of the things have been deleted. Um, deleted, combined, simplified uh, on Raptor 2 versus Raptor 1. It's a little hard to see because it's over there, but... Um, oh, you, can, you can tell a lot. Yeah, giant difference. Like this, the Raptor 2 looks like it, it looks like this, it's not finished. Yeah. Um, yeah. But it actually is. This is, the, this is a finished Raptor 2 versus finished Raptor 1. Um, gigantic difference. And. You can tell this one's a lot more completed with the, the the gimbal mount on top and everything too. Yeah. Well, that's good. They both have a gimbal mount. Um, I mean, sorry, compared to like that one, that doesn't. Uh, yeah. Um, so the, the the outer booster engines uh, don't need a, a gimbal. Right. So they're the outer. The booster engines are fixed, as are the Raptor vacuum engines. Um, so. Uh, but this, this is a, a, a gambling Raptor 2 versus a gambling Raptor 1. A uh, gigantic difference in, in uh, a com uh, complexity. Um, and this is the, the um, Raptor 1 was really around sort of a 180, 185 tons of thrust. Um, and Raptor 2 is uh, 230 tons of thrust. Uh, but really, I think we can probably get over time 250 tons of thrust. Um, so it's, it's sorry, it's 230 tons at, at 300 bar. At 300 bar. Wow. And you're you started. You've been pushing these things to like over 300 too, right? Yeah. So Raptor Raptor One um, could could maybe do like two 250 bar, and it also has a, a, a smaller throat. Yep. So. Uh, whereas Raptor 2, uh, a standard operating pressure is 300 bar, which is kind of, this is crazy for a rocket engine. Yes, where it have is. a main chamber, operate, this is by far a record. Yes. Um, th 300 bar main chamber operating pressure is, is um, it's, it's the highest pressure uh, operational rocket engine ever. Yeah. Um, so the, the next best would be like a RD uh, 180. 180. 
I think they're around 267 bar, yep. thereabouts, yep. thereabouts. And the RD 170 is not, not too bad itself, but it's, yeah, yeah. it's, I, I finally, I no finally. No one's ever done 300 bar. No, especially not sustained. I'm sure they did it, on, <laughs> maybe blew one up and trying to get there or something. Oh, we but, blew, we blew a, a lot of engines up. Yeah. Uh, I've lost count of how many, I, I think we might have blown up 30 engines or, uh, that's a lot. Yeah. Um, so I like, like a high production rate cures many ills. Yeah. So if you if you have a low production rate, like I mean any any given uh, technology development is uh, how many iterations do you have and and what's your time and progress between iterations. So if you if you have a high production rate, you can have a lot of iterations. Uh, you can try lots of different things, um, and it's okay if you blow up an engine because you've got a. a you know, a high production rate, you've got another, a bunch of engines coming after that. Yeah. If you have a small number of engines, um, then you, you you have to be much more conservative because you can't risk blowing them up. Yep. So that's why, you know, one of my cash phrases is, a high production rate solves many ills. Yeah. Um, and, um, yeah, so we, we, we've blown up, <laughs> I don't know, I'm just guessing, at least 20, maybe over 30 engines. And, and the, we have melted probably 50 chambers. Maybe more than 50 chambers we have melted. So when you melt the chamber, are you most of the time able to like save the, the power pack on it? Or do you yeah. just have to scrap the whole thing? Uh, you, the, if, you, if, you melt, if you melt the chamber, it's, it's usually a benign shutdown. Uh, so you, you've lost the chamber uh, the sort of chamber nozzle assembly, but the uh, the pumps are usually fine, and uh, you can potentially even re uh, reuse the uh, main injector. Okay. Um, uh, but it, basically, everything below main injector is is toast. Is it is it potentially benign because as it erodes the the layer, it actually begins to almost yeah. it's, it's, cool it's, itself it, more. It, yeah, it, it, it um it, it's it's benign. Uh, it's 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 like. Benign in the context of rocket engines. Yeah. So, uh, the, until it starves the injector and creates a hot spot, I'm sure, and all yes. that kind of stuff. Yes. So, <laughs> I mean, if you don't shut the engine down fast, uh, you will have an explosion. Yes. Um, but, but you do have an opportunity to shut the engine down um, because you can detect a, a big pr a pressure drop uh, in in the, um, the, the like the, the chamber jacket pressure will suddenly drop. Right. Um, and so, and then you can uh, do you can do a commanded shutdown of the engine, um, but you will have issues uh, if if you don't shut it down because the, um, the, the 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 cooling fluid, the fuel that is cooling, is now no longer cooling the part above it. Oh right. Yeah. So yeah. It, it's cooling where the leak is, but it's it's now doing less cooling of whatever's above it. Right. So it's going to start melting all the way up. Gotcha. So. It'll it'll get ugly fast if you don't okay. shut down. And so that you mentioned at the uh, at the last Star Trek event, you were kind of saying, yeah, Raptor twos are melting. What what have you ended up like? How I guess how do you keep them from melting? What's the what tricks are you continuing to employ and expand out on? Or is it just a matter of tuning the engine back a little bit even to not be pushing it that hard? Or well, the with with the. Right now, we're optimizing Raptor 2 for robustness as opposed to performance. Um, I think broad brushstroke, uh, we're, <laughs> we're, we're kind of overdoing it on the foam cooling front. Yeah. So we have quite a high percentage of uh, head end foam cooling and throat foam cooling. Yeah. So uh, this. Uh, I mean, it's, we're probably losing a couple points of efficiency uh, because of the of, of the, the yeah. cooling, but it's better to have not melting chambers, yeah. and, and we can we can fine tune the performance later. Yeah. Um, so we, we're just hitting cooling with a sledgehammer here. Um, so some a pretty significant improvements for Raptor. I'd like to compare Raptor two to Raptor one um, for. Raptor 1, we have uh, torch igniters in the main chamber. Um, so you can see that the, the torch, uh, those things on the side there are the, the torch igniters. I mean, these guys basically. Um, so you got torch igniters for the main chamber. Um, but Raptor 2 has no torch igniters in the main chamber. So you can see it's much cleaner around the chamber area. 
How do you, um, how's it white then? <laughs> well, that's a uh, secret sauce. <laughs> but I'm just, uh, I, I, can t I can tell you sort of observable outcomes that anyone with a camera could notice, but I cannot tell you secret sauce things. Uh, it, anyone can see what the outside of the engine looks like because we have to trundle the engines down the road yeah. and people have, you know, 12K cameras with telephoto lenses that, that are so precise they can read the serial numbers on, on the wiring, <laughs> literally. Um, so, so I'm not giving away anything, right. any state secrets, literally, uh, by describing things on the outside, but I, I, I have to be cautious about saying how we, got, how we made it work. Gotcha, yep, um, yep. But it, was, um, it wasn't super easy, but, but we managed to get rid of the torch igniters in the main chamber, which is a significant uh, complexity reduction and um, reduction in failure modes, makes the engine lighter, lower cost, um, more reliable on ignition and things yeah. like that too. Yeah, yeah wow. exactly. So it's better in every way. To, it's, it's, it was a huge improvement to get rid of torch igniters in the main chamber. Um, we still have torch igniters uh, for the uh, uh, oxygen powerhead and the fuel powerhead, um, but we were able to simplify those as well. Um, because that's something that would sometimes cause scrubs even to be like a pre-burner itself won't even light. Yeah, if the pre-burner doesn't light or even doesn't light exactly right, uh, then it's you, you've got a challenge. So with, uh, with the Merlin engine, you've got a single shaft uh, that is driving the oxygen pump and the fuel pump. So they're going to, they're naturally, they're, they're mechanically locked. They will always uh, spin at the same RPM because yeah. they're literally on the same shaft. Yeah. Um, so that makes the start sequence for Merlin uh, much easier and simpler than the start sequence for Raptor. Uh, in the case of Raptor, you've got uh, a, an oxygen powerhead and a fuel powerhead, and they're uh, different shafts, um, obviously, and, uh, and you've got two turbines and, and, and two pre-burners. So, uh, and, and they're cross-feeding one another. Yeah. So the start sequence for Raptor is insanely complicated uh, compared to the start sequence for Merlin. It has to be perfectly precise because each Everything's, one relies. It's, it's this, basically, you're doing this this delicate dance between the the fuel power head and the oxygen power head. Um, and if they get out of sync, uh, then then you can go stoichiometric uh, in the pre-burners and, and melt or explode the pre-burners. Yeah. So starting a uh, an engine like this is uh, very, D complex. Um, once it's running, it's much, uh, it's much a much easier situation. Um, but but that if you get anything wrong with that start sequence, uh, you're either going to melt or explode the engine. Well, I, I finally understand too. Once it's running and in a steady state, you know the, the advantage of full flow is it becomes pretty obvious. Just yeah. looking at the the enthalpy and the uh, you know the mass flow through each turbine and the. The, the Delta T and I mean, it's, I finally, it, this just clicked like two weeks ago. I finally actually understood it as opposed to, you know, understanding it ish, but I, 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 I it clicks now and I, I fully appreciate it. Yes. Uh, by the way, I, you have the wrong uh, ISP for uh, methane engines in your video. Uh, you, it's way too generous. Which, uh, oh, the theoretical yes. max ISP. Yeah, that, that, that was, is not possible. That's, I don't know why. I, I, I literally, wore, I was just at a friend's house and they were watching the video. I'm like, I wish we could get ISP like that. That would be a dream. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. But, but it's, it's, uh, it's maybe worth correcting. It's that, that, that's a way higher ISP than is actually physically possible. I wish it were possible, right. but it is not. Um, but the, but f from an architectural standpoint, the, uh, in order to approach the limit of physics of what is, possible with uh, a, like maximizing the efficiency of a rocket engine, a high pressure uh, full flow gas gas uh, engine is, that's as, that's as good as it gets. There's not, as, you'd have to figure out new physics uh, to do better than that. Right. So, so this, the, so the, the rafter architecture is the highest efficiency known to physics. Yep. Um, like you said one time, you said it's as if God himself had knitted the molecules together. You'd maybe get 1% better. Yes, yeah, so we should be able to get 99% combustion efficiency. 99% of theoretical combustion efficiency, which is insane, basically. Um, and uh, yeah, like literally 
with, with, the, with divine intervention, you could do 1% better. Right. And you're doing that really... <laughs> That's really saying something. <laughs> and you're doing that in such a short thrust chamber, too. Like, the actual chamber is so small. Yeah. Uh, because well, it's, Is that because it's gas-gas and it doesn't need as much time to fully react? That's part of the reason. Um, but but also, the, the we actually have um, a whole bunch of injector elements. So when the gas enters the main chamber, it is already pre-mixed. It's like 90% pre-mixed. So you've got uh, swill injectors yep. um, uh, where you've got... Uh, Again, this is sort of a, a class of injector elements. It's a swill injector. Yep. Um, and so you, you, you've got uh, oxygen-rich gas going down the center. Of, of, it's like a little straw, basically. Yep, yep. Um, it, it was, well, yeah. So down the center of the straw, you've got uh, oxygen-rich gas. And then coming in from the side of the straw, with uh, th there are a series of holes that, that are coming at an angle. So the, the fuel-rich gas is coming in uh, sort of Ta sort of tangential to the to the diameter, so it's it's yeah. it's it's coming in At the opposite yeah, direction. Like ox is coming down the straw, and then fuel is coming in from the side from holes that are drilled drilled such that you're going to swill the float. Yeah, and and so that when the uh, when that enters the main chamber, it is already call it roughly ninety percent mixed. Okay. So the chamber is only doing the remaining ten percent of the mixing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, more or less. Um, and so the the actuators there are uh, are those hydroelectrical or what are the, what are those called? No, that's, so we're still using uh, hydraulic actuators. Um, just they're just basically hydraulic pistons. Um, uh, what we want to move to down the road with a Raptor three or whatever we end up calling it, uh, would be uh, electrical, basically a screwdrive, an electric motor with a screwdrive. Just a big servo. Yeah, just, yeah, it's, it's a big servo motor. Um, th this is a temper, like, like what you don't see here is that there's a whole uh, hydraulic system on the vehicle side uh, that it, it itself is there's a battery driving, electric motors driving, um, hydraulic pumps into a reservoir that is then feeding the engine's hydraulic fluid. Uh, this is, when you look at the total vehicle mass, this is not a good uh, approach. Uh, we just don't have time to uh, put um, uh, electric servo drives on the, on the engine. Uh, we'll, we'll do that, you know, I don't know, in a few months. Um, now, with, with Merlin, you've got, you've got a source of hydraulic fluid. So with, with Merlin, it makes sense to have hydraulic actuators because you've got a source of, uh, of high-pressure uh, working fluid because you use kerosene as a working fluid, uh, and you, you, so you tap off the, the fuel pump, uh, take high-pressure kerosene uh, to drive the uh, hydraulic actuators, and then, uh, and then the, the low-pressure outlet of the of the, of the, of the it goes back into the, the fuel tank. Yeah. Okay. So you see, basically, it's a recirculating system yeah. with no losses, and it's it's a super easy move yeah. if you've got liquid kerosene. Yeah. Um, since we have cryogens here, it is technically possible for us to ha to use methane as a working fluid in the hydraulic actuators, but but very uh, scary. Yeah. Because if uh, the methane will want to gasify, right. if you get gas bubbles in the hydraulic system, it's going to get spongy. Yep. And, and it's not going to work properly. Yep. So I did insist that we at least look at the comparison, but this was like the, the mass difference. There, there wasn't a huge mass gain uh, for having a methane <laughs> hydraulic system, and it was scaring the hell out of everyone, so <laughs> me included. So it was like, yeah, I just I think we should just do it so that we aren't missing something yeah. important. Yeah. Uh, but the smart move is going to be just have an electric servo. Yeah. Um, so it's like a lot of a lot of torque because uh, moving this engine fast is not easy. And it um, moves so fast. Like when you see you know those the videos yeah. landing. I mean it is it moves so fast. Yeah. 
I, I, like a lot of the time it doesn't actually need to move that fast, but if you have, say, an engine out, then you've, you've got to, uh, you've got to move, slew all the engines really fast to deal with an engine that went out. Yeah. So, the, like the corner cases kind of drive the, the, the slew rate and the torque needed in the actuators. Um, and the total, and the full angle too, right? The total yeah. gimbal. Exactly. Uh, so if you yeah, get like, it's, it's basically like un, uh, unexpected gusts uh, or buffeting uh, wind shear um, and an engine out that, that drives the, the slew rate. Um, you, you could move it a lot slower otherwise. Um, and then you even simplified what appears to be a, a ton of valves and things almost to that one box or some kind of, almost like you did with the, the oct yeah. was it called the octo valve in, in Tesla's where you unified all the valves into a single yeah. component. Is, is that kind of like what you did here almost? Yeah, we combined uh, a, a, a ton of parts into one. Um, but now it's always better to delete things rather than optimize them, which sounds obvious, but uh, possibly the, the, the single biggest mistake made by smart engineers is optimizing a thing that should not exist. Um, that's why like, I made it really mandatory to run through the first principles algorithm of first question the const constraints and requirements, make them less dumb. Uh, then uh, step two, delete the part or process step. If you're not adding back at least 10% of the things you're, you're deleting, you're not deleting enough. Um, and then the third thing is uh, to, only the third thing is optimize. Uh, and then the fourth is, you know, as it relates to production, accelerate rates. Uh, and then only, only the fifth thing is, is uh, automate. Uh, and I've done it backwards many times. That's why I have to like repeat this mantra to myself <laughs> as well. You wake up every morning, it's written in your mirror. Yeah, <laughs> seriously. Um, and you I need to do it recursively. So. <laughs> um, what's the one thing like when you look at this engine what's the thing causing you stress is there a certain part or a certain thing that you're sitting there going I'm not sure how we'll figure that one out well I mean the, the single biggest thing I'd like to do with uh, Rafter is to um, sort of to delete uh, more of the little fiddly bits like the like the, the sort of the small pipes and, and wiring um, in, integrate um, it basically, it, to, to delete and integrate a little bit more to get to the point where we do not need shrouds. So if we delete the shrouds, that's a, a dramatic reduction in um, mass and, and, and cost and complexity. Um, but if there's, if there's any part of the engine that is susceptible to heat, then we cannot delete the shroud. Uh, now we've made a huge progress from Christmas tree over there. <laughs> Uh, to Raptor One Christmas tree, like that obviously needs a shroud. It's got a zillion <laughs> yeah. th things on it. Uh, it would be impossible to, or to heat, heat, heat all yeah, to pr to protect all of that from being melted. On Raptor Two, we've made dramatic progress, but not yet enough progress such that we don't need a shroud. Um, so the, the shroud would be for protection from heat and. Uh, uh, higher, high uh, aerodynamic force, like yeah. high Q. So, but we're not far. Um, with a little more, little more work, we should be able to simplify it enough to get to the point where no shroud is needed. Um, there probably still need to be one on the booster for re-entry since it comes in engines first. There? No? Uh, no, that's, neither ship nor booster should have a shroud. Wow. I'd, I'd like to, I, I mean, so like, there's a lot of bolted interfaces that would be great to delete, because um, every bolted interface is, uh, uh, well, you, you've got basically heavy flanges, heavy bolts, um, you've got a seal, um, and you've got very high pressure, and, uh, and you've got things ranging from cryogenic liquid to uh, like hot gas, and you've got ox-rich hot gas. So these are, these are things that are very difficult to seal. So stopping a raptor from at least have, fr fr from leaking is very hard. Yeah. Like it's gonna, it, like every every interface there ha it has some leak rate that is above zero, um, and it's heavy and complex and, and everything. So so moving to more welded interfaces uh, is also would be a big improvement. Um, 
I'd, li I'd love to figure out how to, if, if we can get rid of uh, throat foam cooling, that would get rid of a, a manifold and a, and a bunch of interfaces as well. Is that um, hopeful? Like, is that actually in the realm of possibilities or? It's, it's, it's possible. Uh, no, if you say like, if you give enough head end foam cooling, you can get rid of throat foam cooling. The question is, does What's that- trade-off? Yeah, does that cause a, is it worth it? Give it, like, do you lose so much in ISP yep. that it, that uh, you're you're Negating. you're so yeah. yeah? Is it like no longer worth it? Basically, yeah. like, like like it's the penalty the ISP penalty for head end foam cooling could be so great that um, that it's not, that that it, that it, it's it's dumb basically. Right. Um, you know something I just realized uh, like last week uh, that the I think the RD one seventy and RD one eighty does is they actually almost do like an expander cycle with a boost pump. So they actually take all the regen channels and use that to spin a boost pump before everything just to kind of relieve a little bit of pressure on the on the head side um, or on the inlet side. And I had I didn't realize that was an option. And it, it's a pretty cool, um, you know, to almost, in a sense, combine cycle types like that a little bit, you know? Yeah. I mean, a boost pump is useful for reducing the uh, the ellage pressure or the inlet pressure to the engine. Yeah. So. Uh, at, at high thrust levels, we need, uh, you know, fairly high inlet pressure. Uh, as as you reduce the thrust, you you, you need less inlet pressure. Um, so, a, sort of a a boost pump or, or a, a, like a, any anything that's going to increase, like a, any kind of pump that's going to just increase the pressure, even a few bar going into the, uh, the the main pump inlets is helpful for reducing um, how much ullage gas. Uh, you need so it's, a, it's a basically a mass reduction of ullage gas. Yep, yep. Um, but you guys don't have to, your your pump isn't that highly staged. It seems like your your inducer and everything goes so like you know some pumps like the old SSME or the RS twenty fives. You know, a hydrogen pump had like four stages to it or something. It just kept you know increasing yeah. pressure, increasing pressure. It seems like your guys' is so streamlined and simple. Uh, I, I I mean I I don't think of it as simple, but uh, so oh, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so you, you know, take the ox pump up there. You've got uh, a, a dedicated inducer, um, and the inducer is basically like a like a real flat propeller blade. So the the the, the liquid flow coming in is cut at a at a very shallow angle. Yep. Um, so what you're trying to avoid is cavitation or bubble generation. Uh, if you start generating bubbles, the the the, the bubbles will uh, uh, actually eat away at your at your um, at your blades. Like it's weird, like bubbles would chip chip away metal, but they will. Really? And, and and if and if you if you cavitate too much, uh, then you're going to just be a, a bubble generator, and like and you'll lose pressure. Start, so, engine. start the engine, yeah. So, but but even small amounts of of cavitation or bubble generation. Uh, those those bubbles hitting the the metal. Um, it's weird that a bubble could could, eat, could erode metal, but it does. Um, is that more prevalent in the oxide than it is the fuel side, or is it prevalent in both? Uh, it's 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 prevalent. It, it happens in both, but uh, there's like basically the the you, you've, you've got the inlet pressure. And, and the, the inlet temperature. So the colder your, your propellant is, and the higher the inlet pressure, the less likely you are to have cavitation. Yep. And then, uh, the, uh, depending on how your, your inducer blades are designed, uh, that, uh, you, you like, I mean, these are very rough approximations, um, but if you have like a shallow angle inducer, you're, you're gonna generate less, uh, Less of a wake uh, yeah, yeah. than than if you like if say, in, the, in, the, in the limit if you, as you as you increase blade angle yeah. it's as reason just like if you're churning your hand through water yep. uh, you're going to create a, a wake yep. uh, so a, a shallow inducer blade is less likely to create uh, bubbles than than this is a very rough yeah. generalization yeah. but it's less likely to create bubbles or a wake than a shallow uh, angle so the inducer will will will, will cut the flow uh, at a shallow angle. Um, and so we've got we've got an inducer that that uh, has a fairly small pressure rise that then feeds the first impeller, and the impeller is where you really uh, 
a, uh, have a huge pressure rise. So we've got an inducer, then uh, two impellers, um, and that's what gets us to, to our, our, our pressure, uh, to, to our sort of seven to 800 bar on the oxygen side. Um, and we want to actually make that higher over time. Um, but it's a really nutty pressure. That's a very, very high pressure. Yeah. So um, it's kind of, it is crazy that, that you have such a pressurized in, in such a short length. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's an incredibly short length. I mean, it's... Yeah. But, and this is, this is an inline power head. So um, I, don't, I've, I don't believe there's been any rocket engine flown that has an inline power head, but I could be mistaken. I, but I, I, as I, 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 I do not believe there is uh, one. I haven't seen one either. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's that's a first for me. Where it's and that allows you to couple some of the 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 forces too through the turbine assembly, right? Into yeah. The, the, the chamber the, and everything. Yeah. The, the, we actually take the, the the thrust load goes through the pump housing. Yeah. Yeah. So you get you dual purpose the pump housing uh, as as the uh, you know as as the the, the with it. it it, it serves as a pump housing and serves to transfer thrust load. Yeah. Jesus. Um, and it's a straight line situation, so you don't have any tube, you don't have any... Like torques or anything like that. Yeah, you don't have any tube, there's no main, like for, for, the, for the fuel pump, which is off to the side, you've, you've got a bunch of transfer uh, oh, right. tubes. Yep. But for the ox uh, side, you've got nothing. It's all internal, it's all level, the internal channels It's just going stuff. straight down. Yep, okay. Uh, inlet's coming through the gimbal uh, to the inducer, through two impeller stages, um, and uh, and then uh, you know and it's, it's feeding the, the, the turbine uh, oxide turbine and the fuel side turbine. I'm like simplifying a oh, lot yeah. of things, and I may have misspoken on a few. Uh, so forgive me if I've misspoken a few things, uh, but uh, but this is about as simple as you as you can do it. Is have it the, the ox is coming straight through. Yeah. Essentially. Yeah. Um, Something. Uh, interesting that I, I think it was like the RD 701 or some obscure or 501 or something. Uh, I think it was the 501 that ran on fluorine uh, oh, or pentaborine. Fluorine's or insane. Yeah, nasty stuff. Don't use that. <laughs> they uh, they did they used some of the oxidizer for like cooling the chamber assembly, and they used the fuel for cooling the the nozzle extension. Basically, I've never seen that. Uh, it seems maybe counterintuitive, or I don't know what the implications would be of, of trying to use liquid oxygen as a as a coolant, but I, I found it unique they're daring enough to use both to actually do your your cooling. Yeah, I, I'm not sure what the point of using both would be, but um, yeah. Other than, uh, have you ever heard of a dual expander cycle where you heat up both uh, fuel and oxidizer? To me, the dual expander cycles are really cool. It would be a really cool cycle type if you were to do an aero spike because you can kind of exploit the the additional heat, you know, at the at, the increased surface area of, of the throat to be able to do, you know, heat up enough gas to make the expander cycle uh, a higher thrust option. Because I love that the expander cycle, you know, the expander cycle kind of, kind of has a hard limit on, you know, how yeah. much you can heat so up the gas. You start having to. surface to volume ratio issues. Yep, yep. But having yeah. a dual expander cycle, especially if you have an aero spike, uh, it seems like to me that'd be a cool way to ex exploit the two, you know, almost use the weakness of one for the strength of the other. But no one's, from what I know, no one's ever built one. There was a study on one in the 90s or something, but no one ever built a, a dual expander cycle aerospike. And that's still, that's my dream. <laughs> I just, I don't know why I just love aerospikes. They just look so cool. I know I probably bring it up every time I ever talk to any yeah. engineer. I'm like, aerospikes? I just can't help it. Yeah. <laughs> um, if, you, if you have a two-stage rocket, there's really no much point in an aerospike. Yeah, because uh, you just have a you know have a have a nozzle that's optimized for more or less optimized for sea level and have a uh, nozzle that's optimized for vacuum exactly. and you're just you're done you know. Oh, you know what? Uh, what fire? So before Firefly became Firefly Aerospace, when they were Firefly Space Systems, they were working on a an annular aerospike. Uh, the reason why I was talking with Tom Mar Tom Marcusic about it was because they were actually trying to be pressure fed for their their booster. So that way they could keep a really short uh, expansion ratio on the on the chambers. You know, since they don't have much tank pressure, they don't have much uh, chamber pressure. They could do a really short expansion ratio and gain the rest of it out of a out of a aerospike. That was their purpose for doing an aerospike on the first stage was just to overcome the uh, the limitations of of a pump fed system to, to be able to be orbital. 
I thought that was pretty cool. I don't know. I, I mean, you're gonna have heavy tanks no matter what how you cut it. So, the I mean, in the entire history of SpaceX, we have only ever wanted to increase chamber pressure. Right. You have never wanted to decrease it. Yeah. So. That's a good way to put it. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sure there's never been a, a trade where you're like, what if we decrease the Not chamber once. pressure? We've always wanted to increase chamber pressure and we've never wanted to decrease it. We've always wanted to increase thrust and we've never wanted to decrease it. Uh, you know, saying that too much thrust is like you're too good looking or something. I mean, it's just, I mean. Not something you're going to complain about. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we've put a lot of effort into getting the chamber pressure to the 300 bar. Um, I mean, for, for those that are like really understand rocket engines, the, the thing that you'd want to look at is the chamber pressure plot. Um, that's like the inside baseball thing that really matters. Yeah. Uh, and then there's like, they'll often like quote ISP, but actually the thing you really want to look at is um, area under the force time curve. So the, like the, the, the point of the versus versus the mass flow. So you have mass flow, yep. like if, if, for, for a given amount of mass flow, yep. what is the area under the, the force time curve? Area and force time uh, curve. Area under the force area versus time curve. Force. So the, time like curve. The, the point of the engine is to produce force. Yeah. Um, uh, w w when you're calculating ISP, you're, you're making a bunch of simplifying assumptions. Yeah. And, uh, the ISP is actually not constant. So the ISP will fluctuate a little bit depending on uh, ambient. mixture. Well, yeah, depending on, on what the yeah, ambient conditions, uh, what the uh, mixture ratio is, what the uh, what throttle level you're at. Um, and, but the thing that actually matters is the, is the area under the force versus time curve. This, this is the, the thing you, <laughs> Uh, you know, as opposed to an ISP approximation, especially for a vacuum engine, because you're not running the engines in vacuum, so you're making a lot of assumptions yeah. uh, when you're calculating the ISP of a vacuum right. engine. But uh, what you can measure very objectively is what was the how much force did you produce? So you have like time yep. and, and then force, force, and what is and, and the, what's the area under the fo force versus time curve? Okay. That's the because that's what the, the purpose that's of the engine actually yeah. is. ISP is an approximation of that. We need a cool, sexy name for that, for, you know, integrated, ISP. Integrated force. Oh, what? that's not that fun. We need a sexier name for it. <laughs> like specific impulse is, is pretty catchy, so. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay, hey, the force be with you. <laughs> How much force do you, you yeah. This is, a, this is a force generator. Yeah, yeah. So. The force field plot. Yeah. Should we, uh... Yeah, so anyway, this you can see basically a lot of improvements and more to come. Um, and and the, the, a big move will be when we can not have shrouds. Yeah. So. Are you hoping to be able to fire this thing off, uh, uh, do a static fire of booster pretty soon? I, I assume uh, all these are gonna go on booster seven. Yeah, these are meant for booster seven, so. Yeah. That's going to be the craziest thing to see <laughs> when you get 33 of these things roaring. I mean, that's going to be, yeah. that will be utterly ridiculous. Yeah. We, we had a slight issue with the yeah. Booster 7 uh, test where we uh, collapsed part of the uh, LUX transfer tube. Uh, so we're going to go in and repair the LUX transfer tube that. Uh, that collapsed, uh, so that'll that will probably take us a week to fix. Yeah. And something new to the is it new to to B seven? Hey <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Just, <What's> <laughs> yeah, just hanging out, talking rockets. I was just mentioning that we had the lux tra transfer tube uh, collapse, which we've got to go in and repair. It might take us a week or so. Yeah. Well, great lesson learned, but we always get into tests and learn from it. And yeah. So, Black Starship is awesome. <laughs> yep. Rapid iteration. Um, yeah, so 
I don't know what, what we should do. Should we go up and... Uh, yeah, we can look at the high bay and stuff. Yeah, let's do that. Thanks, Elon, for being so generous with your time. And also thank you, Ryan Chalinski from Cosmic Perspective for helping to capture this awesome conversation. And I owe a huge thank you to my Patreon supporters for helping make content like this and everything we do here at Everyday Astronaut possible. If you want to help me continue to do what I do, head on over to patreon.com slash everydayastronaut. And while you're online, be sure and check out our awesome merch shop where you can find shirts like this and lots of other really cool stuff like our long awaited dress wear, our new tiny human shirts, or our 1 100 scale Falcon 9 model rockets. Well, when they get back in stock, find it all at everydayastronaut.com slash shop. Thanks everybody, that's gonna do it for me. I'm Tim Dodd, the Everyday Astronaut, bringing space down to Earth for everyday people.